So for those of you that were wondering, I did end up watching NXT TakeOver War Games. And while it's taken me a little bit to get to it, since I watched the show, it only makes decent sense that I would now review said show. A couple of things to kind of point out here before I actually talk about the show itself. Number one, I can't say I'm that surprised that there were quite a number of empty seats in the arena for this show last Saturday night. Honestly, when you look at the card, this was not one of NXT's better cards. There's not exactly a ton of like, you know, NXT star power there. And mind you, I'm not somebody that watches the product a lot, but just as kind of a semi-casual observation, not quite as many bigger names, you know, no Bobby Roods, no, you know, uh, Kevin Owens, no guys like that that you've had in recent times, Samoa Joe, so on and so forth. Um, the star power was a little lacking for the show. And just looking at the build-up to this show, like, there weren't a ton of matches. There wasn't a lot to get excited about. Sure, you had the prospect of a new NXT Women's Champion. You had an NXT Championship match. You had War Games. So there were things to care about. Uh, Alistair Black, Velveteen Dream in terms of a story. But, again, it wasn't something that I could see a lot of wrestling fans, even the hardcore fans, sitting there saying, I got to go to that, and I also want to go to Survivor Series, so I will go to this show instead of Survivor Series, or I will pay big money to go see NXT TakeOver War Games. I don't know if the appeal or the allure of the War Games match making its return for the first time in many years was enough to get the job done. Still a really good turnout in the grand scheme of things for a glorified indie show. You know, how many indie shows wish they could ever draw that type of audience for an event? I'm just saying. Now, in terms of NXT, it's not something that I watch weekly. I typically will watch each of their takeover shows um, because one I haven't really seen a terrible takeover show yet I've seen some really good ones I've seen some eh ones but nothing that's really terrible uh, number two I kind of sometimes will look at it as an excuse of will this be the show that finally gets me to start watching NXT again and the previous ones have not and this one still did not do enough to get the job done but at least I can say this. The one thing that is kind of somewhat refreshing about an NXT is because I'm not as immersed in the weekly stories and the weekly show, because I'm not as immersed in some of the finer points and details, I can take a slightly more casual approach to watching the show. Sure, there are still elements where I'm going to question things about booking decisions or the way characters were uh, booked in the match, the way matches broke down, the way the match was itself. Now, that's not going to change, but... I can't quite go into the same depth as I would for something like a Raw or even a SmackDown. And that's kind of refreshing. I can just kind of sit back and watch. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about this show. You kicked off with Lars Sullivan versus Cassius Ono. And what was refreshing to me about this match was you had two guys that clearly work a physical, hard-hitting type of style. The match could have gone longer, but it shouldn't have gone longer. It was actually like a really, really, really well thought out, well mapped out, well planned out opener for the opponents, for the type of story you were trying to tell. Just because you can go 10 to 15 minutes with an opening match doesn't mean you should. And in this particular case, I think it went just over five minutes. I thought that was perfect. Now, apparently Lars Sullivan has worked a lot of squash matches, so this is kind of a big uh, platform for him in Houston at TakeOver War Games. And I thought he acquitted himself relatively well. I mean, the type of style that these guys worked was the type of style where you could hide a guy's deficiencies and accentuate their positives. And Cassius Ono was probably a good opponent uh, to help kind of showcase Lars Sullivan, especially if you're ramping him up for something bigger in the future. Um, fine with the opener. I was just fine with it. I thought it was a good start based off of the type of match it was. It was initially my reaction was, man, that was really short. But as it set in, I'm like... It was perfect. It was just fine for what it was supposed to be. It wasn't supposed to be spectacular. It was supposed to give a little bit more exposure to Lars Sullivan, give him a little bit of shine, and that's exactly what it did. So mission accomplished for WWE. Um, it just really set the table nicely for the next match, which to me, beyond question, from my style of being a wrestling fan and what I look for, was the clear-cut match of the night. 
That was Alistair Black versus the Velveteen Dream. Now, I look at this character that Patrick Clark has, the Velveteen Dream, and that makes me want to vomit. Because there is something inherently ridiculous about the WWE where they think most of their black performers need some type of suspect, sissy-ass, gay-ass type of gimmick. And now we could talk about he's trying to mimic Prince and all of that. That is fine. And in and of itself, the guy has clearly taken ownership of being the Velveteen Dream and is trying to make it work. And that's cool. It's what's working. But it's at what point in time can we find different types of characters and different types of personas for these black wrestlers to be? You know, it's bad enough when the New Day does all this suspect-ass crap. I don't need the Velveteen Dream doing a bunch of suspect ass crap too. It's the point being is for some reason Vince McMahon, Triple H, WWE thinks that black men will either sit there and A, like to dance, B, like to rap, C, like to commit crime, and D, be all types of suspect and kind of sissy-ish. And just like they have a fetish for this, like they, like this is what they love. Um, I don't. I hate the fucking character and you're not going to change my mind about it because of what it represents. That said, the story that I was brought up to date with in terms of the video packages and the story that was told throughout the match, I thought was great in terms of the Velveteen Dream. is trying to establish himself and he's trying to make a name for himself and he wants Aleister Black to know his name and say his name. And while the Velveteen Dream is far from a finished product in the ring, there are a lot of these other things that really make a quality professional wrestler that this guy has. You know, the wearing of the Rick Rug Rude style uh, spray on, um, not spray on, but you know what I mean. Like he had the faces on his trunks, thought that was awesome. The way the guy works, like he actually works like his character should work. Uh, just so many things about this match were just so perfect to me in terms of actually bothering to tell a story. Like, looking at this card, the War Games match, to me, tells little to no story. Not that in the grand scheme of things, for that type of style of match, it needs to tell that much of a story, but it didn't. I didn't think the NXT Championship match told much of a story. I most certainly didn't think that women's Fatal 4-Way for the NXT women's title told much of any story at all. Uh, Lars Sullivan and Cassius Ono told a little bit of a story. But I'm a big guy for stories. I'm a big guy for characters. And Aleister Black and Velveteen Dream give re gave me everything, absolutely everything, that I could have possibly wanted. While some of the action was not the crispest, it doesn't matter. I'm sorry, it doesn't. It's great to see a match that has purpose, that has meaning, that has significance. How the whole match plays off of one concept and one story. Velveteen Dream trying to get Aleister Black to say his name. And even once the finish happens, and by the time you've gotten to this match, it's kind of interesting because you take a Velveteen Dream and he's really, really over with the crowd while Aleister Black is still also maintaining to be over with the crowd. And Aleister Black goes over, but at the end tells the Velveteen Dream, he says, enjoy your infamy, Velveteen Dream, and Mike drops and off he goes. And now it's like everything you could accomplish in a match, in this match you did. The whole premise for the Velveteen Dream was getting Aleister Black to say his name. He lost the match and won the war, so to speak, because he got Aleister Black to say his name. You still had Aleister Black win, he looked really good, and he was cool enough to give some respect at the end and move the hell on. I could see why people are big on Aleister Black. I don't know just how big his main roster potential is, but I could see that he does have some potential. And I could see that the Velveteen Dream, as a performer, has a lot of potential, but a long ways to go in terms of the in-ring aspect. That said, I could give a shit less about that in-ring aspect, because the story told here was magnificent. Easily, to me, my favorite match of the night. Which cannot be said, any way, shape, or form, about that NXT Women's Championship Fatal 4-Way. It was just... There's no heat on anybody, really. There's no real story here other than, to me, you just have four women trying to go out there and win the belt. Um, I look at it, and it just really fell flat to me. I thought the match was a little short. I, in general, am not a big fan of four ways like this, and I could see why, especially watching this one. There's a lot of long rest spots, and 
occasional bumps and it's like you're bumping to bump to bump to bump and then you get that choreographed look and crap like in particular that double eclipse or whatever the hell ember moon does off of the uh off of the turnbuckle it, it just looks like shit and this match to me was shit and the shittiest thing of all was Ember Moon finally gets the NXT Women's Championship, and instead of it being like a double arm raising, hell yeah, it was just kind of like a, yeah, yay, that's all right. And then how appropriate and how fitting that Asuka, who couldn't actually drop the strap to her back before SummerSlam when it would have really made a difference, when it really would have fucking mattered like this company should have had her do, now she's there to hand the belt to Ember Moon when it doesn't freaking matter as much. And this is what it comes down to. Ember Moon should have beat Asuka for both characters now and specifically in the future. And it was reckless of the WWE to not do it. So now they do it and now Ember Moon wins and it's kind of like, eh. And that's what it was. It was an eh match with an eh finish and the payoff was eh, and it was disappointing. I know a lot of people like the NXT Championship between uh, Adrian Cien Almas and Drew McIntyre. I don't know if I was as big on it. It was just, there was a lot of bumping and a lot of shit crammed into 15 minutes. Uh, now, Tia Trinidad, Selena Vega, she's clearly added something to Cien Almas, and I see it. Because my perspective of him compared to a few months ago has changed significantly. Um, but I thought it was really strange that you just had Drew McIntyre drop this strap here. I, I did think that was a little strange. But I could get it. I could see it. Maybe they didn't think Drew was long for NXT anyways. It was time to go in. And I look at this match and there were moments where it was really good. And there was moments kind of fitting to Drew McIntyre's career. Where there were moments where it was just kind of blasé and kind of mediocre. Um, it was okay. Maybe just a little bit better than okay. But I probably don't think this match was nearly as good as a lot of you do. And that's okay. It's just difference of opinion. Uh, but ultimately, this show was going to be about the War Games match. And, you know, old school guy. I wasn't huge about there not being a roof on the War Games cage. But I understand that, you know, back 25, 30 years ago when you did War Games, these guys weren't sitting there and climbing on top of the cage and doing a ton of shit like that. They were sitting there beating the hell out of each other in the ring, getting colors, so on and so forth. So... You're, the, you're NXT, you've got to figure out ways to push the envelope because you can't just go out there and openly have everybody juicing and bleed all over the place. Uh, this match was fine for what it was. It was very long and it should have been very long. Um, the rules of war games can get a little bit convoluted and it seemed like they modified them just a little bit because of the type of tag match it was, but it was okay. I really don't have any major complaints about it. But it's one of those things where it's the first time we've seen this match in a long time and it felt like it should have been on the Survivor Series card. Does that make sense? I mean, it's cool to see the double rings. It's cool to see these this massive freaking cage. I mean, these guys busted their ass in that ring and they did some major shit. But to me, War Games should really be the culmination of a major story and have huge stars. And I don't feel this War Games match had either of those. And while I know a lot of people love Adam Cole, baby! And the Undisputed Era, I think their name is kind of stupid. It feels like something you would come up with on the independent scene. And I don't know if the three guys in that Undisputed Era group really came out of this match looking all that good. Even though Adam Cole got the win and he pinned Eric Young, it was just kind of like, eh. And then where do you go with this and where do you go from here? Like I said, these guys busted their ass and they did some really wicked stuff. And um, Killian, whatever the fuck his name is, I thought he shined here quite a bit. Um, I thought the guys did a good job and I thought the match was solid it was just one of those you don't think a lot matches you just kind of bump your way through them but it was just something missing to me and in general for this show there was just something missing Alistair Black Velveteen Dream was outstanding you know one of my favorite matches of the year I won't say it was one of the best but it was one of my favorite matches of the year because of the type of intricate story that it told all the way throughout but I thought the NXT title match was just kind of there. I thought that NXT women's four-way was kind of a waste of space and a disappointment. And the War Games match, to me, just missed something. 
So while I wasn't that disappointed with the show and didn't think it was bad, I don't think it was nearly as good as you're probably going to see a lot of people have overrated it as. And it's not surprising because it's one of these things. It's whatever. But good show, not great show. Hopefully in a couple of months in Philly, they'll do better because they can do better than this.